Boa tarde, bem-vindos e bem-vindas. Welcome to this timely and very important discussion on Brazilian democracy under siege. My name is João Bill. I teach anthropology here at Princeton University, and I am the director of the Brazil Lab at the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies, which is hosting this event. We are grateful to SEBRAC, the Brazilian Center for Analysis and Planning, for sponsoring the colloquium, and also to the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, the Program in Latin American Studies, the Department of Economics, the Department of Anthropology, and the Department of Spanish and Portuguese for their co-sponsorship. As we start our Brazil lab activities this fall, Brazil is indeed in a dire situation. The government's mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in the death of close to 600,000 Brazilians. The country faces record rates of unemployment, hunger, and economic inequality. Amidst a soaring inflation and a huge energy crisis on the horizon, we also witnessed the escalating deforestation of the Amazon. The last few months have seen President Jair Bolsonaro sowing the seeds of a grave institutional crisis probing the limits of constitutionality with a particular vitriolic attack on the Supreme Court and the electoral system, fueled by fake news campaigns, spurious political alliances, and an authoritarian rhetoric from Bolsonaro and his supporters on the streets, all with a view to retaining power. We have a most distinguished group of Brazilian scholars and policy experts with us today, Oscar Villena, Maria Hermínia Tavares de Almeida and Arminio Fraga to help us tease out the many facets of this unprecedented crisis of Brazil's young democracy and probe, hopefully, possible alternatives. Let me say a few words about Arminio Fraga, a great friend of all things Brazil at Princeton, and who will introduce our speakers and moderate the event. Arminio was trained in economics here at Princeton and is a former president of the Brazilian Central Bank and the founder of Gavi Investments. He's also the co-founder of the Institute for Health Policy Studies and more recently of the Institute for Development and Social Mobility. Together with Oscar and Maria Hermínia, Armin is also a columnist at Brazil's main newspaper, Folha de São Paulo. This is our format today. After Armin's introduction, Maria Hermínia and Oscar will speak for about 15 minutes each. For the audience watching from home, the chat on our, YouTube cha on our YouTube channel is open. So please feel free to ask questions as the event unfolds. Our team will be collecting your questions and will forward them to me and I will pass them on to our speakers. The event will last no longer than an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you all for being with us today and Arminio, the ball is in your court now. Thank you, thank you, uh, João. We are very fortunate to have with us uh, here today two shining lights during this moment of, of darkness, really. Um, and my, my role is just to make a quick uh, introductions. They're both uh, very well known. Um, and and just, just for the sake of getting going. Um, we have here with us uh, Professor Maria Hermínia Tavares de Almeida. She uh, is, has a very illustrious uh, career um, in the area of political science. She's a professor at USP, uh, a, a member of SEBRAPI, uh, and has um, uh, also, as was mentioned, uh, been uh, an active participant in the, in the public, in the public debate in the policy debate in, in uh, really in, in uh, putting out very sharp uh, uh, pieces of, of, of really interpretation of, of what is going on uh, in Brazil. Um, along with Maria Hermine, we have Oscar Guilherme uh, Villera, who, who, who comes from a background of, of law and political science. He's a uh, he is the, the dean of the, the School of, of Law of the Fundação Getúlio Vargas in São Paulo, uh, a renowned constitutional uh, expert, human rights, uh, you name it. Uh, also extremely active uh, in the voice uh, uh, of reason uh, in, these, in these tough times. 
we're going to start with uh, with Maria Herminia, um, and and then after that Oscar, and and we'll all uh, jump in. So my uh, uh, my greetings and my thanks to to both um, our guests, Maria Herminia. Uh, over to you. The, your, your mute, Maria Minha. Oh, yes. Okay. It's okay now? Can you hear me? Yes. Well, well thank you very much. I, I'm very pleased to be here with you. Uh, and I would rather be at Princeton, not in my office, but anyway, I hope we have a, a, a good conversation. I want to thank Pedro Arminio for, for this invitation. Um, let's begin. Uh, I would say that there are two levels of threats to democracy in Brazil. The first, the most immediate and pressing, comes from uh, the president himself. The second is related to a more, to more deeper trends in the Brazilian society, manifested at the level of the citizens' values and attitudes regarding democracy. Uh, I'm going to, to talk a little bit about the two, the, the two levels. Let's begin uh, with the, the present danger. We live in a political, we live a political paradox, actually. A democratic system that is presided by an authoritarian politician who has no allegiance to democratic values and no respect whatsoever for the democratic rules. Uh, some of my colleagues uh, have summoned up the Levitsky and Ziblatt's model to explain, to explain what is going on here in Brazil in the present times. The slow corrosion of the democratic institution by an authoritarian ruler who uses the power acquired through elections to control the Congress, uh, to control the judiciary and the media in order to twist, to warp democratic rules. Well, this, is, this model uh, is not useful to, to understand what is happening now in Brazil. I think that fortunately, this is not what Bolsonaro is doing. He's, he does not have a party. He, does, he didn't organize a party uh, for his own. Uh, he, he does not have any kind of organized movement, although he can mobilize a lot of people, as we have seen in the September 7, he did not try uh, to have a majority in Congress that could allow him to pass authoritarian legislation. So we are not in the face of uh, uh, le le authoritarian legalism. Uh, he did not try to control the traditional media. He cannot control the judiciary. Actually, his strategy is one of a permanent confrontation and defiance to democratic institutions, a combination of insult and menace, of hate, speech, and denial. He is more a kind of destructive force, a master of chaos, than a builder of any sort of authoritarian order. So I think that the uh, Levitsky model uh, as elegant as it is, doesn't help us to understand what is going on in, 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 in Brazil. And I would say that as for today, his confrontational strategy is being successfully contained by democratic institutions in Brazil. The Supreme Court, the Congress, although it's, a, it's the most uh, right-wing, right, -wing, right wing led Congress we have ever had, as much as the traditional media, the press, some of the important networks and the organized society. Those forces have in a, in a sort of a way been successful in containing his permanent confrontation and production of a chaotic 
politics. Of course, uh, this is a very unstable situation. If he eventually is capable of producing more than rhetoric chaos, anything can happen. We can, uh, in the after the when I, we are discussion, we can elaborate a little bit more uh, about what can happen uh, in in Brazil due to to his behavior and the capacity of of, of the institutions to to control him to contain him. But I'll, I'll leave this now at this point. And I would like to talk about the second level of threat that I think it's more permanent, that predates Bolsonaro's election and probably will survive him. It has to do with the existence of a deep rooted trends in Brazilian society, trends that point out towards disaffection regarding democracy and democratic institutions. Uh, to, I asked Mikaeus to, to show the tables I have prepared, because to make my, my points, uh, I, I'd like to, to, to go to the, the, these tables. And to put the, 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 Brazilian, uh, the Brazilian data in a Latin American perspective. The first table uh, is, shows the answers for this well-known question about support for democracy. What we are seeing here is the, uh, the proportion of, of, of uh, citizens that think that, that democracy is always preferable. Uh, the original mean is 48%, which is not a very outstanding. Uh, uh, a percentage, but at, at the at the left side, you see those countries uh, that have they are above the the, the regional mean, yeah, and at the right, you see those that are below. As you can see, Brazil and Mexico are in a very awkward, strange group, because being developed well, developed countries uh, with. Uh, some democratic life and some tradition of, of democracy. They are together uh, with the very small countries. They have a very turbulent political history. A son of them had faced uh, civil wars, guerrillas, and all, uh, and all that. And there, there is the group where, where Brazil is. The data comes from Latino Barometer 2018. It's not a, a, a good year for, for, for Brazil. We, uh, we, uh, we, it is a year that, uh, uh, that uh, comes after a long, uh, long period of crisis, of political crisis. But anyway, uh, this is the last date of Latino Barometer, which is comparable. Mikas, please, the, the next graph. Uh, this, I sh this is a graph showing the evolution of support for democracy in Brazil since 1995. Uh, I'm, I apologize for not uh, having translated the, the, uh, the, uh, the graph, but uh, I couldn't do it in, in due time. Uh, the blue line is support for democracy. As you can see, uh, only during uh, very uh, determined pe periods, uh, this percentage went above the 50 percent of the uh, uh, of the Brazilians. The red line is that of those who think that in under certain circumstances, uh, an authoritarian regime is better than a democracy. And the green line is the line of those that say for people, like me, it doesn't matter. And what has changed, uh, uh, what is important to see is the, 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 the growth of those people that say it doesn't matter and, uh, and uh, the presence of this uh, significant group of people that say, well, democracy, authoritarian regimes, it's not my, it's not my problem. Uh, please, Mikaeus, the, the last um, 
table. And this is, uh, is the results from the question about trust in institutions. Uh, what I have here, what I, we have here uh, uh, are issues, are institutions uh, uh, were uh, regarding to, to which Brazil is above the regional, uh, the regional mean. And in the, in the right side, uh, Brazil is below uh, the, the regional mean. The first percentage, the first figure, is the, the regional mean, the Latin American mean. And the second one is the, the, the Brazilian results. As you can see, uh, Brazilians trust a lot the church, the military, and the those are the only two institutions that are, they are trusted by more than half of, the, of the, the, the Brazilians. And then comes the police, the judiciary, uh, the media, the NGOs. And the right side are all the political uh, institutions, the electoral court, the Congress, the government, and uh, last and least, the, 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 the political parties. Uh, you can, uh, okay, uh, Mikaias, the, that's okay. Uh, what those data uh, show us? What all this means? Uh, we have a lot of disaffection regarding political institutions in, in Brazil. And this disaffection is not new, although has increased a lot during the, uh, the crisis of the, the 2010. One may ask what? So what? Actually, democracy can live along with the satisfaction, in, with a lot of, uh, of the satisfaction, uh, as long as there isn't a political force that is willing to mobilize it for his or for her political purposes. And indeed, we have lived for a long time with this situation. Uh, since 1995, data of Latin barometers show that almost all Brazil is with this a group of countries that are very different in history and uh, is the political instability from us. The Central American uh, countries, Peru and all that. And we have lived and democracy produced results and we have stabilized the economy and we have uh, uh, had some uh, income redistribution that worked. Uh, from the democratization to 2018, that worked, and these uh, this, uh, this feelings that, exist, uh, that existed in society didn't have, didn't have uh, a political uh, translation, uh, didn't have uh, a political expression. Then came Bolsonaro. I, I remember that, that I went to a, to a, uh, to a seminar at Sebrap in 2014. I have shown similar data and, uh, and a colleague said, but what is this? People don't trust parties, don't trust the Congress, don't trust the government, the, the, don't trust the, 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 uh, the electoral uh, court, but say the democracy is okay. Uh, what kind of, what is this? I said, well, some, at, at some point we will know what, uh, what this means. And I think that we have uh, understand the meaning of this in 2018 uh, elections. Uh, so uh, I will uh, finish here. What I'm saying is uh, that uh, Bolsonaro may lose elections, Bolsonaro may disappear, and uh, that would be a great news in Brazil, 
but the relatively fragile support for democracy and democratic institution will be always there, or, or at least if we are not able to change this, will be a latent uh, threat uh, for a stable democratic system. It will always be a potential base for extreme right, for uh, right-wing populism, for authoritarian projects. So uh, in, in summing up, I think we have a, a present and clear threat that maybe we can overcome. And I think that we probably will overcome, but we have some basic problems in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the Brazilian democratic systems that are much more difficult to, uh, to overcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Mina. Mina this is... Um... Very impressive. I, I hadn't I hadn't seen the, those data. Um, I hope we get, can get back to that, uh, Oscar, if, if you will. Okay. Uh, well, it's an immense pleasure to be here with people that I have such an admiration. Uh, you forgot something in my CV, which is that I I, I was a student of Maria Edminia. So uh, this is the most important thing. And uh, it is, it's, it's nice to be and have the opportunity to dialogue with you. Uh, well, uh, Armino asked me a specific question uh, some days before this, uh, this talk, which was to focus on, the, uh, on how uh, the institutions of checks and balances are working in Brazil. So after Maria Mina give this broader picture of democracy in Brazil, I will focus on, on the institutional side of it, specifically uh, how constitution is being uh, protected by Congress and the Supreme Court. So uh, it is a constitutional lawyer uh, approach, not a political scientist approach to the, to the issue. Uh, so uh, if Rekias could put uh, uh, um, my presentation, which is nice, so I didn't put all these nice tiles on it. Uh, but if you could go to the first uh, slide, please. Okay, so uh, uh, as you know, the new idea of separation of powers was built by someone who was on the 1771 class at Princeton, uh, who is James Madison, we, who has this uh, clear perspective that uh, the majority could hurt the rights of the minority. So he has a concern with populists since the beginning when they are putting together this modern idea of constitutionalism. And one of the mechanisms, one of the tools to protect the rights of the minorities against uh, uh, populism was to frame the government with uh, uh, separate branches with separate interests, with contradictory interests. So I think Madison was uh, extremely careful in, in framing this new way of governing. And the Brazilian constitution of 1988, in, in some sense, uh, took it very seriously. So if you could pass to the, the, the next slide. Okay. So it's important to have a little perspective of how uh, the Brazilian democratic model was designed in 1988. So Brazil has passed uh, through an authoritarian regime from 64 to, to 85. It has also experienced an authoritarian regime from 30 uh, to 46. So it was in the memory of most of the Brazilians and several of them who, had, who was in, in a war in the, the Constitutional Assembly, uh, the dangers of authoritarian. So the first characteristic of the, the 1980 Constitution is that it's a, a very consensual democratic model. In other terms, it has several counter-majoritarian mechanisms to protect the Constitution, uh, mostly against uh, the danger of having an extremely powerful executive. 
But this is not the only characteristic of the 1988 constitution. The constitution is also uh, very ambitious. So there was a, 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 a perception of insincerity of the political class at that moment. So the, the, the constitutional decision was to introduce in the text of the constitution, all uh, the demands that those who have power in 1988 uh, uh, wanted. Uh, I, I recall another dialogue between Thomas Jefferson and Madison, uh, because as you know, uh, Jefferson was out of the convention. He was in Paris at the time that the US constitution was being made. And he was very angry uh, uh, with Madison because there was no Bill of Rights in the original constitution. And Madison explained that it was uh, very difficult to arrive to some uh, uh, decisions. So they adopted an, a, a strategy of a every one second choice. Since it was not possible to arrive to, to clear substantive decisions, they would decide on getting the procedures right. Uh, so I would say the Brazilian constitution of 1988 is at every one first choice. It's just an opposite the strategy of the Americans. So when we uh, uh, were debating what should be on the constitution, there was this strategy of accepting everything in. So the constitution is very extensive. It covers, it's ubiquitous in the sense that every theme uh, uh, that has uh, uh, some importance in the Brazilian politics, it is uh, 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 written in the constitution. Why I'm saying this? Because this will make it much more difficult uh, for a shift when you have a right-wing politician elected because it has to deal with the constitution that took many decisions that uh, could be considered very progressive. So the notion that the constitution is extremely extended and covers too many aspects, makes the life of any president, but most of all of a president with a right-wing perspective, uh, that uh, his life will be very difficult because he will have to change not only some regulations, not only some ordinary law, but you have to change the text of the constitution. The second characteristic uh, is that Brazil tried to protect itself from an extremely powerful uh, presidential uh, system that we had during the military regime by expanding the powers of the parliament. So one of the characteristics of the Brazilian parliament that is composed by a multi-party system, which is a consequence of a proportional representation uh, for those who get elected uh, to the lower house. And since the size of the, 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 the districts in Brazil are very large, so the number of uh, political parties in the Brazilian political system is also uh, extremely high. At this moment, I think we have 33 parties in the parliament. So why this is important? It is important because any president who get elected with the majority of the votes would have to deal with a parliament that is very fragmented. It will have to create a large coalition of parties so he can uh, 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 move with his uh, proposals. Uh, so one of the questions that uh, 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 we will see here is the difficulty that Maria Armenia already mentioned uh, of the President Bolsonaro to pass his bills in Congress. The third characteristic that I would highlight about the Brazilian constitution at this moment is that uh, uh, since the constitution is very extended and covers too many issues and the Supreme Court has the attribution to protect the constitution, that means that the Supreme Court has to get involved in too many issues. So there was none uh, uh, important issue, economic, moral, political issue during this uh, period in Brazil that the Supreme Court was not uh, uh, invited to, to provide uh, its opinion, normally the last word. So in Brazil, uh, we have a, a Supreme Court that expanded its power over these 30 years. There is a second characteristic of the Supreme Court, 
which is that the Supreme Court uh, uh, holds in its jurisdiction, in fact, uh, three different kinds of attributions. One is a constitutional court as the European are. Uh, it is a Supreme Court in the sense it's a court of the last appeals, but also has a special jurisdictions over uh, criminal activity of a higher authority. So every member of Congress is uh, uh, submitted to the Supreme Court jurisdiction. That means the Supreme Court holds a lot of power over the political system because it protects a large constitution, because it has the power to uh, declare unconstitutional even amendments to the constitution. So it has a last word over uh, 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 a decision of Congress to amend the constitution. And it has a uh, power to, to has jurisdiction over the members of Congress in terms of criminal law. Okay, so my point here, and then I, I go to my two or three last slides, uh, if you could pass Matthias, is, how an, uh, uh, a populist, authoritarian, conservative, right-wing uh, uh, president who was elected, but as Maria Minia said, without a large coalition in Congress, in fact, his party or the party that he belonged to until some time ago, it, it was not a majoritarian party, how he deals, how successful uh, uh, the president is uh, uh, in, 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 in Congress. So here you have two rates. One is the success, uh, success rates. Another one is the dominant race. In fact, there are two different uh, uh, things, but it shows how a president can pass legislation in Congress or the legislation that the president supports is approved in Congress. And as you see in both measures, uh, Bolsonaro is the least successful president uh, from those who were elected uh, since uh, uh, 1993. So he's a very unsuccessful president. And even if we take the 31% success that he has, most of the legislation that he was able to approve is linked to budget, which counts to for 20, 23% of the legislation. that Bolsonaro was uh, uh, able to pass is the budgetary legislation, which interests a lot uh, of members of the Congress. So what we saw here is a very unsuccessful president, which bails out some of the strategies that authoritarian populists uh, uh, impose in many countries as Hungary, as Poland, as Turkey, uh, or even Venezuela where they dominate Congress. So as uh, Maria Arminia also said, we are not seeing uh, during these two years a complete revolution or erosion of the legal system. There was no uh, amendment to the constitution that could say it put at risk uh, uh, our democracy or our system of the rule of law. There were two minor uh, amendments. Well, one is not minor, but uh, it, it, it reformed the pension system, but it was negotiated before there was a large consensus uh, on it. But basically, Bolsonaro wasn't able to move one uh, relevant amendment that would put at risk democracy in Brazil. Second, most of the conservative legislation that uh, uh, he was proposing to pass uh, during uh, the election uh, was very unsuccessful also. So if you could change the, the slide, uh, what we see in, in, in Brazil is not a kind of autocratic legalism as uh, named by King Chaplin, also Professor Princeton, or abusive constitutionalism. What we are seeing in Brazil is a president uh, um, putting in place a different strategy, which is abuse of its administrative prerogatives to try to block, uh, to try to impede the policies that were uh, established in the 1980 constitution. So what we have seen here, and I'm, I'm just giving some numbers, uh, uh, so now is the president who uh, edited the largest number 
of executive orders or the decrees uh, in, in, in Brazil. And most of these this decrees are oriented to uh, reorganize uh, bureaucratic agencies and many of the bureaucratic agents that are responsible for the implementation of the rights and the policies, the progressive policies established by the 1980 constitution. So what we are seeing here is someone using the prerogatives uh, to overcome its incapacity to train, to change the legislation or even to change the, uh, the constitution. Bolsonaro also uh, made use of appointments of officials that are antagonic uh, to the functions that they are, were supposed to implement. So you would have a racist person on the foundation that, co that takes uh, uh, care of the implementation of the anti-racist policies or anti-environmentalist minister that would try to block all the legislative uh, and constitutional policies regarding uh, in the environment. So Bolsonaro uh, tries to combine executive orders, uh, changes in appointments, which I, I know that Maria Arminia would say, well, but every pres president changes, uh, no, uh, nominate new people that are aligned with their position. Yes, this is right. But here you have the perception that some of the people that are appointment, appointed are in contradiction with the legal foundation of the functions that they would uh, 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 occupy. And it's interesting that the Supreme Court has decided that some of these dominations were not valid because they were so contradictory with the, with the function. And also uh, Bolsonaro use of something that I call para-institutional orders. So it gives an order to Twitter or to some radio uh, 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 broadcasting to authorities that he nominated and these orders are illegal. So it's very difficult to, to cut, uh, to, to invalidate orders that were not legally given. They were orders uh, given to power institutional means. So uh, this means that we are uh, facing a different kind of uh, uh, author authoritarian populist that is minoritarian in Congress. And, and that's how he tries to overcome his in incapacity. So my last, uh, if you could change to the next slide, or there are two slides. So how uh, the Supreme Court, this uh, extremely powerful Supreme Court is reacting uh, to these attacks or to this infra uh, legality that is attacking uh, the constitution and is attacking the legal order in Brazil. During the first year of the Bolsonaro government, uh, the, 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 the Supreme Court was strangely very quiet. The Supreme Court is very vocal in Brazil. Uh, justices are very vocal in Brazil. They give interviews, they talk immensely. And it's, uh, 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 However, the, the year that Bolsonaro arrived to power the Supreme Court, not just was uh, less vocal than normal, but also decides much less cases than normal, much less cases arrived uh, in the Supreme Court. So uh, we have 51 uh, constitutional cases arrived at the Supreme Court. It provides only 17 decisions uh, uh, at that year, and uh, it took uh, 370 days uh, uh, for, for the decisions to be taken. It, uh, something happened that in 2020, the Supreme Court changed very uh, significantly its, 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 uh, its posture. Uh, so there are some reasons for that. One, the attacks over the Supreme Court, the attacks received by the Supreme Court, attacks coming from uh, radical right-wing groups, and also from members of the family and members of the, of the cabinet of the president. Uh, and also there was uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, the president, as you know, took a very uh, uh, anti-scientific uh, uh, position regarding the pandemic and tried to forbid governors and uh, mayors uh, to take uh, uh, the combat to the pandemic in their hands. So uh, there were uh, there was several case, there were several cases brought to the Supreme Court. So what happened in 2020 is that first 
the Supreme Court started to be much more responsive from a differential posture in 2019. It shifted to a very responsive uh, posture in 2020. Many more cases arrived. He started to decide the cases in a much faster way. And also it's interesting that the decisions became much more collegial. The Supreme Court in Brazil, I will not take your time here, but uh, it decides in a very monocratic individualist basis, which is starting to happen in the US, uh, by the way. So uh, what we saw after 2020 is a, 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 a court that is responding uh, very directly to the present. And this in some sense explain uh, the last attack uh, uh, of Bolsonaro in the Independence Day on, on September 7 uh, to the Supreme Court. So the main target of the Bolsonaro stream right groups and in his attacks was the Supreme Court and some specific justices in the Supreme Court. So uh, this is, uh, in some sense, uh, I am agreeing with, uh, with Maria Ermina in the sense that the, the institutions are uh, uh, being responsive to the attacks. They are holding much of the authoritarian uh, reforms that uh, could be proposed by Bolsonaro. And until this moment, I think the institutional structure of the Brazilian state is uh, uh, in some sense uh, 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 holds its, its integrity. Obviously, and this is my last phrase, that Brazil is, is a very unegalitarian country with several problems in terms of public security, public health. So uh, if uh, Bolsonaro's strategy to create ca uh, chaos, uh, to sell some security. Obviously, this is uh, something that put uh, Brazilian democracy at risk. But until this moment, we have uh, to understand that the institutions with all uh, mm -hmm. its uh, defects uh, are holding together. Here are just some cases uh, that uh, can be emblematic of the reaction of the Supreme Court against the most anti-constitutional attacks uh, made by Bolsonaro. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, these were two extraordinary presentations, uh, very profound and um, a, a refreshing step back from the, the noise. You know, reading the press in Brazil um, seems to take for more and more time every day. And it's, it's for me anyway, I, I, I try to do that, but it's, it's very, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to um, have a clear structural view of, such as the one that the two of you have presented. I, I have two, um, two questions, uh, one for each of you um, that I, 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 I believe might help um, um, understand a little bit of the, of the fear that um, uh, I believe is pervasive in Brazil, despite, and I agree, and, and I, both of you were very convincing, despite the display of, of institutional strength that we are seeing. Um, so first, perhaps to, to, to Maria Herminia, um, I, I would um, ask that you comment on the, on the military and the role of the military. Um, there, are, there are a large number of military um, uh, people in government. Bolsonaro himself was, um, uh, was in, in the army. Um, and he has also, in parallel to um, um, all, the, all the threats and, 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 and all the uh, the rhetoric that has been very, uh, very aggressive against Congress, against uh, the judiciary. He's also done some things that, uh, that scared people, including um, his approach to um, 
allowing uh, ample access to weapons and ammunition, um, his constant threats to the Supreme Court. And then we hear military people saying, you know, okay, this is fine, but um, uh, the, we hear the phrase, oh, but you cannot stretch the, the rope um, directly translating from Portuguese. And, and, you know, and we have a long history of, of, of the military being around or in government. So perhaps, but I mean, you could comment on this. And to Oscar, um, I, I, I wonder if you could uh, talk to us about um, this parallel universe of, the, of what the Bolsonaro government does and how they operate well, uh, in in um, in the sort of the internet, um, and it's sort of a fertile space for um, the sorts of ideas uh, that uh, have ultimately had had Bolsonaro elected, and and whether we can count on uh, defenses for democracy that go beyond the the checks and balance, the classic checks and balances of Madison. I'm talking now, you know, the press, academia, uh, the nonprofit sector, and so on. Uh, so, if you if you could comment on that, perhaps Maria Hermine, you can you can start. This is the the golden question. <laughs> Very difficult to uh, to uh, to answer because. Actually, we don't really know what is going on inside the, 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 the military, okay? And we have some hints, but let's think about the, 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 the models that have been used to, to, to understand the relations uh, uh, between mili the military and uh, and uh, politics, and it comes from Alfred Stepp and the classic uh, book, uh, Alfred Stepp's uh, book. Uh, what he said, that during a long period of time, the military from the Republic uh, until 1964, the military uh, act as a moderate of power. They, they uh, established the limits inside which which the politics uh, uh, and the po political conflicts were, were acceptable and intervene when uh, they thought that the, these limits uh, were uh, overcome, were supersede. And in 1964, uh, this, uh, there's a change in the pattern and the military uh, really uh, take, uh, take the power and, uh, and uh, this is another uh, another pattern. What we have uh, had uh, since 1995, uh, the literature said, but, well, the military had um, back off to a, a kind of professional pattern, uh, and they don't mess with uh, with, with the political conflict. And it, we don't need to think too much about, about them because they are, uh, they, they are busy with uh, problems of security, of, uh, of international security, of, uh, of capacitating the, 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 the armed forces and et cetera, et cetera. I think this be, began to change uh, with, without us seeing this, uh, because uh, actually the, the civilian government, since the PT government, began to give different uh, tasks, uh, internal security, security tasks to, to, to the military. In the Amazon, in the Amazon 
actually uh, begins before this begins in, in, in Fernando Henrique, but in the, in the Amazon, in security in the Amazon, especially the, the what we call in Brazil, the operations of law and order, when the military uh, 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 participate in operations, security operations in, in, in the cities, uh, there has been several under Dilma, especially under Dilma, but also under the Lula's, uh, Lula's govern. And this has given the military another role. It's not a role of participating in the political conflict, but, but, but a role in establishing order inside the country. And on the other hand, what we have done also it was uh, uh, given a, a, um, a road to the international road to the, to the military with the participations in the United Nations missions. And uh, this was very prestigious. And the military came from Haiti, where they have done nothing <laughs> very good, but they came from Haiti almost like heroes. And uh, they were kind of, of uh, representatives of Brazil in, in, in some international, international arena. So I think this ha has given some uh, some how do you say this, uh, some confidence to, to, to the militaries about the roles they, uh, they can have internally. Of course, this has began, of course, this uh, also occurred while uh, we had a, a civilian in the Ministry of Defense and uh, the civilian ministers uh, di didn't do much about what the military were, were doing. I, I think there was a kind of truce. I'm here, you respected me, uh, but I, I won't say anything about how, what you teach in your schools. Uh, or how do you think, uh, how do you uh, organize the career and, and all that. So I think that the, the, uh, the absence of, of policies uh, from the politicians, from the civilian politicians toward the militaries uh, has created a kind of vacuum uh, that now uh, uh, Bolsonaro uh, is trying to, to change. What has done Bolsonaro regarding the military? Um, increase the budget, uh, has a, a, a rhetoric uh, 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 and uh, a rhetoric that uh, that uh, um, give importance to 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 the military and that uh, acknowledge the importance they they, they have and uh, and all that and but a lot of military in in government there has been military in government, not the administrations also, but the, the, there has been a huge change. The, the question is, what, what are the consequences of, of, of this process? On one hand, of not having a clear policy regarding the professional role of the, of the military and what this means, okay? And on the, on the other hand, uh, how far uh, support for, for, for Bolsonaro uh, can come from the, uh, the, what he has been the, doing regarding the, the, the military, uh, military forces. There, there's a problem here, I think. I, I always think about what Barbara Touchman uh, said about the, the First World War. She said that the difficult, difficult to, to understand what was happening is that people uh, reason with previous experience. This is the only thing a social scientist can, can do. And so if you, are, if you think about what we know about coups, because the, the question of military has to do, are they going to support a coup, a military a, a coup uh, 
uh, that uh, that uh, gives more power, gives authoritarian power to, to Bolsonaro or not. Uh, what we know about the, the military coup uh, says that they are not they are, they are, they are not the conditions uh, the, that in the previous uh, occasions made the military uh, uh, take, uh, take power directly. Uh, the elites are not pressing for this, and the, the elites are, are increasingly uh, abandon the, the, the Bolsonaro, uh, the, the huge uh, uh, investors, uh, the, the huge entrepreneurs. Uh, you don't have the media with him. Uh, yes, we have the streets, but it's clear that uh, September 7 is the best he can do. It's, it's, it's huge, but it's the best he, he, he can do. So uh, I, I, I don't know. The, 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 the issue that we don't have the, the conditions that were in previous school does, doesn't assure us that <laughs> this can be different. Okay. Uh, but uh, may, there are two po possibilities of, of the military uh, uh, participating and, and taking part in this in, in this process. One is a coup pro Bolsonaro. The other one is a coup taking him out. It's a Bolivian coup that takes out the problem and then. Uh, draws back to, to, to a position of not a direct participation in, in, in politics. But in, in the matter of fact, we don't know. What I think it's not uh, plausible are theories that say, oh, not the military, the military police is either one or the other. If, the, if Bolsonaro appeals to insubordination, either in, in, the, in the military forces or in the military police, I think the, the reaction, the military institutional reaction cannot be uh, pro-Bolsonaro. Pro uh, so uh, the, the question is, is there uh, due to, to the present policies, is there, uh, is there a possibility that the military can support uh, Bolsonaro against uh, the huge entrepreneurs and against the huge investors, against the, the, uh, the traditional media, against uh, political institutions and political parties and the majority of governors? which is one of the elements of the consensual model that uh, uh, Oscar has, has discussed. I don't think it's easy. I wouldn't say it's, it's completely out of the, of the picture, but I, I don't think it's easy. Unless Bolsonaro creates a, such a, a conflict, a political, conflict in the streets, et cetera, that they are, they, they think they should, uh, should come and uh, organize things and, uh, and reestablish order. But in this case, maybe it's against Bolsonaro, not in support of him. Over to you, Oscar. This is a good uh, connection to... Um... <laughs> Okay. Was... Yeah, but just just to to don't send the wrong impression regarding the you know to be over enthusiastic or over optimistic. Uh, what I think I wanted to say was that even though institutions, formal institutions, are holding on and they are really containing uh, some of the attacks that Bolsonaro is, is making to, to democracy, not to democracy, but mostly to the constitutional uh, uh, model established in 1988. 
That does not mean that he is not being able to provoke uh, enormous erosion in certain areas. Uh, and I think environmental issues uh, specifically are uh, one area which we are seeing uh, this, this erosion, indigenous people's rights, uh, the police, uh, we are seeing uh, uh, an increasing number of police uh, brutality in the last uh, two years. Uh, human rights in general, in terms of the attacks of the gay community, etc. So he's creating an environment that is very aggressive against uh, certain areas. And also, uh, um, there is some erosion in certain areas of the federal administration. And this is why I mentioned that it's very important that Brazil is a federation where you show. Uh, uh, that uh, institutions at the state levels are reacting in a different way. But the question you, you, you posed was about uh, this, this new word, uh, the digital war, the attacks, and, and Bolsonaro and his uh, uh, supporters are much more efficient and capable of dealing with this area than uh, his opponents. And that was the result of the election. He had about eight seconds in television. Mostly the, the traditional campaign in Brazil is made by, by free time in television proportional to the size of your parties. Uh, so Bolsonaro had a very tiny party, tiny time in television. And uh, one of the, 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 the candidates, uh, the central right candidate has five minutes against eight seconds. But even though he was able to uh, overcome uh, this difficulty, that shows how uh, uh, capable they are of packaging message to a fragmented uh, uh, number of stakeholders, of, of supporters. Uh, so we are, I, I was giving class before this conference and, and one of the students were drawing, uh, drawing a map of who supports Bolsonaro. So it's basically a very contradictory group. So the agribusiness, but also uh, the, the Bible group and also young people who are considered themselves nerds. So it's, it's a very strange group, but he was able to fragment the information uh, and, and send this information. That's why I think he is very uh, uh, strong in the internet. One of the battles that we are seeing being fought at this moment is a battle uh, about uh, a legal uh, suit at the Supreme Court who is investigating both uh, crimes against democracy committed through the internet and uh, uh, diffusion of fake news uh, in the internet. So uh, the Supreme Court is also a, a target for, for Bolsonaro because it is trying to control this underground uh, uh, subversive moment, movements in, in the internet. And finally, uh, uh, what we are seeing in terms of civil society, uh, uh, Armenia, I think uh, you are right. Uh, it is, from my, uh, from my uh, perspective, uh, uh, the civil society is being very vibrant and intense on the defense of democracy. So human rights groups, uh, democracy groups, we are seeing them uh, flourishing at this moment in Brazil. Uh, we are seeing a shift, uh, as Maria Arminia also mentioned, in terms of those of the business community that supported Bolsonaro uh, in the election. And uh, uh, as he becomes more and more radical, are getting out of the boat. So before this Independence Day, uh, large manifestations, and, and uh, since he was uh, escalating in his authoritarian discourse, we saw agribusiness people uh, moving out and expressing that was unacceptable. Uh, we also saw members of the business community that you take part also uh, uh, praising very strongly that they were against this kind of rhetoric. And just to finalize where Maria Mini stopped, uh, there was a, a fear that the military police, every state in Brazil has a military police 
And the, the, the military police of the state of Sao Paulo has more than 140,000 people. It's the second largest army in the country. So I'm, we are not talking about something small. We are talking about large, and they are responsible for the law and order ordinarily in, in Brazil. So they and they were very conservative. They have been very violent and anti-human rights along this uh, their history. So they were not uh, trustful in terms of their loyalty to democracy and constitutional values. So there was a fear because Bolsonaro tried to seduce them for uh, some kind of insubordination. And uh, what we saw it, it was, was the opposite. Uh, they behaved very properly. Uh, the military were very quiet during this Independence Day, which normally they, they do a lot of noise. Uh, so it's interesting that uh, uh, we can see, we, we have one side of it, which is people are concerned and are protective of democracy. And that's why perhaps he, he, he uh, also with the possibility of him being uh, uh, convicted of a crime or his family, so uh, he's shorting uh, uh, in terms of his alternatives. And that's why he's escalating and he is uh, aiming to provoke some kind of convulsion. Is in some way his only alternative because electoral alternatives are decreasing for him at the moment. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your presentations. There's a lively discussion um, uh, out there and many questions and actually the, your response is now addressed already some of the questions that our uh, you know our audience our audience had and then um, let, let us go back to the to Maria Erminia uh, Tavares presentation um, many people you know congratulated you for your analytic you know the way you you separated and you you looked at the, the level the long-term levels of threat and uh, we have uh, a question from, uh, from our good friend of Princeton and the Brazil lab, Professor Marcia Castro uh, from Harvard uh, Public Health School. Uh, she asks, do you think, uh, Professor Maria Arminia, that a new generation of politicians rising to power can help build trust in democracy? Also, don't we need more literacy and conversations about politics, including history in schools? And uh, along those lines, uh, João Bardi also asked, what are the possibilities for strengthening democratic culture in Brazil? And I think one question also for Professor Vilhena, uh, along, Oscar Vilhena along those lines is, how do you see the phenomenon of people, you mentioned people mobilizing human rights groups, but also people going to courts, this process of people claiming their constitutional rights in courts. Um, many scholars tend to see this as hindering the functioning of, uh, of politics, but other scholars tend to see this as an opportunity to show how people are claiming their rights in courts and forcing the courts actually to account for those constitutional rights. So I would like you to explore a little bit more this, the, the, the democratic possibilities in judicialization as well. So that's a first round of questions. And then there's another round. So if you could just choose a few key points and then we can have a second round uh, on these fantastic questions that are coming uh, from our audience. Oh, uh, very, very, very quickly. Uh, it's a kind of kaleidoscope. <laughs> you, you look one way, you see all the bad things <laughs> that we have produced. You, you, you look the other way and uh, lots of interesting and, and positive things happening. I think that one of the positive things happening is there is a new generation of, polit uh, of politicians in, 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 the, 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 in, in development. They are very, uh, very young, etc. but I think that the political system, since it's, it's open, actually, it, uh, the, the good side of fragmentation is the, uh, the lower barriers to, to, to entrance to, to, to political, political career. And so I think there is a, a movement of, 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 of renovation, a renew, renewal, 
<laughs> of renewal. Uh, this is much less in the progressive field, you, but you have also in the center and center left field very young uh, uh, young representatives, and I think yes, uh, the question of education. It's a it's a it's a more difficult thing because we 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 have well more deep problems with education. We have we are we included everybody in the system in the in the twenty first century, and the levels of of the quality of our education is still very, very bad, although it has improved, uh, improved a lot. So uh, I think the school is important. We don't know what will happen now. Uh, differences in schooling have increased with, uh, with the pandemic, but certainly the schools are, are passed uh, for, uh, for not only for social uh, Progress, individual, uh, individual progress, but also for changing uh, the, the the political culture. But I, I, I think there are lots of things happening in, in Brazil, and we should look the different, the positive and the negative things. I maybe I have stressed the negative aspects only. Mm -hmm. Great, yes. Scott. Okay, so this is wonderful question. Uh, well, I think judicialization, uh, and I'm taking here more judicialization of, of political questions, of social uh, issues questions, not judicialization in general, uh, is a sign of two, uh, two events. One, people are much more conscious and trust, uh, uh, trustful of, of, of legal institutions, and that's why uh, they decide to 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 search uh, for their interests or their rights or their justice in, in in the justice system. But on the other side, it's also a sign that the political system was incapable of solving and delivering uh, solutions that would make people comfortable what with what they had. And I think uh, both both of these uh, movements uh, occur at the same time in Brazil uh, as. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, there is some uh, uh, analysis now going on about uh, Supreme Courts tend to be stronger when uh, there is more fragmentation in the political system, when the political system is more uh, uh, incapable of providing uh, uh, society with, with key decisions and uh, the cost of deciding uh, hot issues for the courts sometimes seems to be uh, less expensive. So take uh, 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 gay marriage. Uh, so no politician in Brazil, even the left, was uh, uh, eager to decide on this issue, to send a bill to Congress. So at a certain point, the Supreme Court had to decide this. Uh, uh, and this goes with abortion, this goes with gun control, and several other questions. So is judiciary governing by a delegation? And uh, what is being delegated are issues that the political system does not want to solve or doesn't have uh, the capacity due to its fragmentation to solve. So this overburden uh, uh, the judiciary, which use its, its, its uh, extremely scarce political capital to decide and loses authority in the long run. So I think this is also a, a consequence of the Brazilian uh, political system. Uh, so in fact, what we saw here uh, is, uh, was I think uh, uh, Maria and Mina shows some of the, the curves in terms of the, 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 the trust in institutions in Brazil. And it's interesting uh, that when we saw the decline of, of most of the representative institutions, the parties, the parliament, et cetera, until 2017, we saw an increase in the trust of the judiciary because the judiciary were, was not just providing rights for minorities, being very vocal in implementation of identity rights, of, of social rights, 
but also the Supreme Court was being very tough on crime and very tough on white collar crimes. So there was uh, this. However, uh, uh, there is a point where when the Supreme Court hurts extensively so many politicians, uh, there was a, a clash and an agglutination of forces against the Supreme Court. So then you start to see a decline on, 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 the, uh, on the confidence uh, of the Supreme Court. So I fully agree, this is a paradox. If the judiciary is too good, is providing too many answers, it will uh, uh, hurt the political system. But in fact, uh, uh, when the political system is not providing the answers, normally there's a society which is more conscious of its rights search for the judiciary. So it's a, it's a hard balance. And I think at this moment, uh, uh, the judicial institutions in Brazil are recovering part of the, the political capital that they lost during the crisis that started in 2013 and uh, 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 ended with the election of, not the crisis, but uh, uh, ended with, with the election of, uh, resulted more, uh, to be more proper, with the election of Bolsonaro. So I think we are in these circumstances now. No, no, that's fantastic. And I think some of those, and we are, we are starting to wrap up our conversation, but yeah, your final answer, Oscar, was very much um, an answer to the question that one of our students, Sue, uh, who is a, a Brazilian attorney and an anthropology, Lucas Pratis, had asked, you know, what's the value of the imbalance during this moment of right-wing extremism if supremocracy the term that you coined, you know, uh, it speaks also to a certain imbalance in the separation of power. You know, what does, how this can tilt things in, in, in important ways, given the, the current um, uh, right-wing extremism. So the other question that I will just read them so that just to account, you know, for concerns that the audience have in the spirit of, of sharing with you. And then maybe after I read this final set of questions, you know, we have a, each one of you, you know, Armenio, Maria Mina, Yoskar, you know, just a word or two, final, you know, brief comment, you know, in the spirit of to be continued, that the conversation, the incredible conversation that we're having here might continue among ourselves, you know, other events and so on. So from uh, Fiona Macaulay, the question also, what is the likelihood of the superior electoral court, right, ruling Bolsonaro ineligible? to run for re-election. You, you mentioned some of that, that's possible given the current in, uh, investigations, right? And I, and I think one, um, one big question, right? From Luis Carlos Brito, also complimenting everyone for the, for the, um, for the presentations. You know, my question concern markets reactions which swing from supporting or not the incumbents. Do big corporations have any role in the process of democracy being under siege? And which role do they pay, do they play in things being otherwise, right? Um, and I think from uh, another question about the military, then it was a theme that Maria Arminia uh, discussed with us from Feliciano de Saguimarães, how to put the genie back in the bottle? Right. So, and I think another set of questions had to do, and this is a whole new seminar on the anthropology that you brought to us, Maria Nini. You know, so so this this trust in democracy, but the trust in God and the military, right? So, so we'd be we would be curious to hear from you. How are you thinking of this Brazilian contemporary uh, subject? You know, maybe we don't have a name for that subject, maybe you don't have a concept to understand what's going on, but this subject at this, in this 21st century who, who, who is contesting democracy and is asking for more God and for more military. So I leave you guys for some final comments. It's all open and, and I'm throwing a lot, but this came from the very engaged audience. So I, I'll make a couple quick comments and get out of the way. Uh, Folks at Princeton see me uh, often enough. Uh, I, 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 you know, I'm an economist, and I'm, I'm just constantly thinking about why it is that we 
as a nation have been unable to do better. We've done a lot, there's been a lot of progress, but there hasn't been much in the way of convergence towards the higher standards of living in the world in the last 40 years. Uh, yes, uh, social, um, there's there important uh, improvements in, in the social world, uh, declines in inequality, but inequality remains high and um, we're, we're struggling to uh, get back on some, some track. So I think in the end, um, I come out with, um, um, I must say, a, a better, um, more hope than I had before listening to the two of you. And I'm, I'm privileged to, to, to have uh, some interaction with them, not enough uh, for me as an economist. But I, I, my question I leave out is, you know, will we someday be able to move towards um, um, a system that uh, uh, can lead us towards more, uh, more prosperity? There's a question that wasn't um, uh, made, but I think it is too late for us to get into it. But, but this, the hot topic is where, whether there will be uh, an alternative to the two uh, candidacies that are um, um, they're out there, uh, the natural um, re-election bid of the incumbent and, and the, the powerful political um, uh, former president uh, Lula. And, 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 and the issue is going forward, can we look for a pendulum that doesn't swing so much, particularly, I would say, uh, as we, we see now with the current uh, administration. Lastly, a quick pause, comment on the, on the positive note. Un unlike the US, where the Supreme Court um, made the very famous uh, Citizens United um, decision that opened uh, the floodgates of corporate money, uh, in Brazil, we went the other way. So I think you see now um, an interesting new world of um, where, where, where um, the quote unquote elite, the rich, uh, the corporates um, have less room to maneuver um, than before, where the conven conventional media is also a lot weaker because we're flooded with um, uh, noise and, 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 and targeted um, uh, so uh, games, um, and so it's a it's it's a new world. And then we have thirty three parties. So thirty three parties, not a, not a lot of corporate money, conventional media, television time is not that important. So I, I I find this to be terribly unstable and difficult. But we could move on. I I I I don't have um, more to say. I'm leaving with. Um, uh, a lot of things to to think about, but um, I'm slightly more more I'm more confident that um, um, it, it seems very difficult to imagine that Bolsonaro would succeed in a coup. I also, however, think with the um, the situation we have in the in the House of Representatives in Brazil, the opposite direction, which could be an impeachment or some other. Uh, uh, legal uh, measure against Bolsonaro is also, at the moment, not very feasible. So it's a, it's a, it's an unstable uh, situation. But but it could last until the elections, and uh, and then you know the Brazilian people would have a chance to uh, to decide you know whether they want to fire the current administration and look for something better. I uh, hope so. Anyway, so maybe we can invert the order and, and let uh, Oscar, Oscar uh, make his final uh, remarks and, and then uh, Maria Herminia. And thank you so much. This has been spectacular. Much, uh, much appreciated speaking here from my Princeton uh, um, uh, credentials. Thank you. Uh -huh. thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for, for the, the invitation. Well, <laughs> As last remarks, uh, just to, to be irresponsible and move a little bit out of the institutional box that I put myself, is uh, obviously a deep 
deep, profound, and persistent inequality affected the basic notion that uh, reciprocity, that people uh, receive what they deserve, uh, that they are treated with, with equal concern and respect. So I think this is a problem. There is a lot of unfulfilled promises in the Brazilian democracy. After 30 years uh, with, uh, uh, with the constitution and progressive governments that even though they were able to, to, to make reforms and provide uh, uh, um, some uh, better conditions of living uh, uh, on health, on education for millions and millions of people. Uh, most of the population still are living in, 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 in conditions that are very severe. And uh, uh, on the top of it, uh, there is a, a, a problem that was not attacked um, by uh, most of democratic politicians in Brazil. I'm saying governors and presidents, which is the problem of public security. So many people in Brazil live in conditions of war leaves unsecure the whole time, mostly uh, until the end of 90s in large cities, but this moved to the interior. So there is a lot of unsatisfaction. There is a lot of resentment, which opens the space for uh, a populist uh, uh, seduction. Uh, at this time was uh, a populist seduction uh, from the extreme right which none of us believe because Brazil has a social issue to be solved. And Bolsonaro was basically extreme right against social rights. So I, I would say most of us were wrong in terms of saying he would never win uh, because everyone who wins in Brazil, even the right wing, they should address the social issues. And he didn't want to address. So I think there is a lot of challenges uh, to come. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, what uh, Arminius said, in terms of the feasibility of another uh, uh, candidacy besides Lula, because uh, the, the main, the, the center right, uh, and I think Maria Arminia wrote about this uh, one of these days, uh, to address the social issue. Uh, that is a point. I, uh, well, uh, Arminio is saying this all the time in others. So this, I think, is the challenge for, for the center in Brazil to be to, to build a, a trustful discourse in terms of incorporation, even though they were in power for 30 years and they were not able to solve many of the issues. Uh, just to not leave my friend without the answer, uh, Fiona, uh, I, I do not believe the, the electoral court would grant a decision that uh, would uh, um, uh, impede Bolsonaro to, to run, uh, but with one footnote. I think the Supreme Court and the Electoral Court, what they did in the last years, in the last year and a half, was to create conditions to uh, criminalize Bolsonaro activities. I don't know if they will get to the end of this, but this has a component of trying to detain his escalation. For a normal politician, as Temer was, he would comply with the judiciary, lower his voice and survive. Bolsonaro did this after September 7, but we don't know if it will last. But what I'm seeing both at the Supreme Court and at the Electoral Court and in other courts is creating cases so uh, 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 preemptively, they will try uh, to contain his escalations. Wonderful, yes. My dear Mina. There are lots of noise here, so I, I, I'm sorry I cannot answer the questions of my good friends, Luis Carlos Brito and Feliciano. Uh, we can continue this discussion by other, uh, by, by other means. I, I would like to, to say two things. First, uh, uh, Bolsonaro didn't create the, the, this uh, this stream right social base and stream right organizations. They were there. He gave 
a, a national expression to, uh, to, to this. When you look to the Congress, they part of this was in the Congress since long. The, the, the preachers, uh, the, the represented uh, the police uh, that became representatives. And so we will have we will have to deal with this in the future for, for a long time. The, the right, the, the uncivilized right, the stream right is, is here. It is produced by our society, by the, the, what we didn't, couldn't da, have done to, to, to improve the situation uh, of lots of, of Brazilians. And I think that the political, uh, uh, political uh, arena uh, will we'll have to deal with this, with this new force that now has a face has organization, has the, uh, the social media and, and all that. And this is new. They were there. We didn't see it because they didn't have a, a clear uh, political national expression. Now I, I turn uh, uh, position with, uh, with Oscar. Uh, I talk a lot about uh, society values and here about the uh, institutions. I went, uh, I will went with the institutions. We have a, a, a consociative, a consensual uh, political system. It's, it's very good to, uh, to hinder uh, extreme changes. No, but it produces very slow change because everything must be negotiated and you have the, the, the Congress, the multi-party system, the federal system, all that uh, is the, the, all that are the features of a consensual model. This consensual model is very good to produce moderation but it's not very good to produce change. And so in this, in this we are. Oh. Thank you so much for the opportunity of- Oh, no, we, we thank you, Maria. No, we thank you, Maria Minha and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and Oscar. Thank you so much for all you have given us. And we hope one day we can bring you to campus here. We can welcome you here and we can continue the conversation um, in person. And we will keep reading your works. And we also want to thank so much Arminio Fraga, our good friend and colleague, you know, for helping moderate the event, help to organize, have been in contact with the, with the speakers. And as I said before, you know, to be continued. We, for our viewers, also a final note of appreciation. Thank you so much for being with us, for watching, for engaging, for your probing questions and comments. We hope you will be here with us for future Brazil Lab events. Please subscribe uh, our YouTube channel. And in two weeks time on September 13th, uh, 30th, sorry, at this very time, we will hold our second colloquium with Princeton Nobel laureate economist, Sir Angus Deaton and the Brazilian economist, Ricardo Paes de Barros, who has helped to design some of the Brazil's most successful social policies. They will be talking exactly about uh, what we were talking about at the end of our session today, a pandemic of inequality. And in this case, critical perspectives from Brazil and the United States. So, and the event will be moderated by our own uh, economist and the Brazil Lab Associate Director, Tomas Fujiwara. So stay well, you know, see you soon. Take good care. <laughs>